Hello and welcome to the Gaga where we challenge and if necessary destroy media narratives. I'm George Samueli. With me today, of course, is co-founder of the Gaggle, Peter Lavelle. And we are very uh, fortunate uh, to have once again as a special guest, uh, Professor Mohamed Morandi of Tehran University. He's a frequent guest on the Gaggle. Um, obviously no, needs no introduction to our listeners, so very lucky to uh, have him. And obviously there's a great deal uh, to discuss. So. You know, I'm not going to take up uh, too much time. I mean, I, I, I'll throw it open to you. I said, where are we now? I mean, we've, we've now had, um, you know, more than 100 days of this. And, um, you know, how, how do you see where we are now and any way, you know, do you, do you see any kind of uh, resolution uh, in the near future? Or asked it differently, how's that Western support of Israel going for you? It is quite amazing uh, in one sense, because uh, everything that we've been saying all along is happening, and that the longer the war continues, the longer the United States insists to, that it should allow the Israelis to attack, the worse the situation is going to get across the region, the more uh, dangerous it becomes, and um, inevitably, unfortunately, that's what's happening. Uh, what we're seeing today in the Red Sea is a standoff between the Americans and Yemen. And to be very blunt, it's about Israel. The Americans are supporting Israel. They want the Israelis to have uh, all the support they can get to carry on with genocide, the way I see it. Ansarullah, the Yemeni armed forces, made a very simple statement. They said that we are going to blockade Israeli ports until the killing in Gaza stops. That was it. And they told ships to change course. Some did, and those that didn't, they attacked those ships, damaged them, but not severely. And no one was killed. So the ships, after being slightly damaged, they'd shift course. Because they have heavy missiles. They have heavy drones. They can sink these ships, but they preferred not to do so. They were trying to encourage the West to shove uh, the Israelis, push them towards a ceasefire. But what the Americans did is they did the exact opposite. In fact, the Secretary of State, the U.S. Secretary of State, Lincoln's trip to the region, his last trip, was mostly about gathering support for aggression in the Red Sea. So what the Americans did was they killed 10 young sailors from Yemen. They're just like Israelis. They don't care, even though they haven't, they didn't kill anyone. They weren't planning to uh, kill any people, but they killed them. The Western media, of course, as usual, they supported genocide. They're obviously going to support killing 10 young Yemeni sailors. And so we, we had escalation. And now the Yemeni armed forces said that since you've attacked us, your ships are also going to be targeted, including ships uh, that are owned by American or British companies. And then what do we have? Does the United States rethink its policy or find a way to find to, to, to solve this? No, they push the Europeans to bring in their own armada. So is that going to fix the situation? No, because Yemen, their capabilities are all underground. They were bombed for seven years by the Saudis, the Emiratis, with the support of the Americans and the British and the French and the Germans and the Canadians. For seven years, they carried out the same sort of genocide that we're seeing today in Gaza against Yemen. Of course, back then, people didn't go to the streets, not for Yemen. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, there was a report that came out that said almost 400,000 people in Yemen were killed. Yeah. And I think it was the International Crisis Group report, which is not sympathetic to Ansar Allah or the Yemeni people. It's American and pro-American. So almost 400,000 people were massacred. Weddings were bombed, funerals were bombed, school buses were bombed. We all remember what happened to Yemen. I'm, because I know that your audience is a politically uh, informed group of people. So the Europeans, instead of 
apologizing for what they did to Yemen, instead of trying to, or instead of at least trying to find a solution alongside the Americans, now they want to go back to striking Yemen. But as I said, for seven years, Yemen was bombed. All of their in installations are deep underground. Whatever Gaza has, they have much more of that and much better weapons because it's a much bigger country. Well, and uh, it's Professor much Rennie, what do you, what are the, you know, because uh, before um, the events of October 7th, um, there was a um, there was a tentative uh, process towards a well there was a ceasefire and a tentative process to resolve uh, the Saudi uh, uh, Yemen uh, issues is is that in a deep freeze right now because the Saudis you know is nefarious of a role that they may play from time to time they don't want to mess with the, the with, with Yemen again I mean is this this in stasis for the time being well as you rightly put it. The Saudis don't want to mess with Yemen again, because as the war went on, the balance of power shifted away from Saudi Arabia. Yemen began to began to acquire uh, drone technology. Or Aramco felt threatened. <laughs> yes, exactly. So uh, by the, when the when the ceasefire was agreed upon, it was when the the Ansarullah um, group and the Yemeni armed forces. Because they are the government. They've been in yeah, San on that, That's why I refer to it, Yemen. For decades. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but um, they were they had the capability to destroy the Saudi uh, oil production and their refineries and their petrochemical plants. So the Saudi and the Saudi saw that American weapons weren't stopping them, so they decided to stop. The Saudis don't want to restart the war because Yemen is much stronger today than it was two, three years ago. And also because of the situation in the region, Saudis want uh, the, the government to uh, support Palestine. According to polls in Saudi Arabia, 96% of the people want no Arab government to have anything to do with the Israeli regime. So the Saudis are in a, tough position because the Americans want them to join their coalition, but the Saudis uh, know what would happen if they if they did. The Iranians have, during the seven year long genocide against Yemen, the Iranians said repeatedly to the Saudis that you've been spending billions of dollars. And I think by the end of the war, they spent, spent well over $200 billion maybe over 300, I don't know the numbers exactly, but I'm, I'm sure it's over $200 billion. The Iranians were saying, if, if you spent just 1% of this money to re help re rebuild Yemen, you would have allies in Yemen. You would have excellent relations with Yemen. But the Saudis ignored everything that the Iranians said and went down the road of genocide with the Americans and the Europeans. And I just just as a footnote, that war initiated when Obama gave the green light. He right. gave the green light to that war. The really nice Obama who, you know, uh, he's somehow different from Trump or or maybe Biden or no, they're, they're, they're all. I, I they're remember, all he, and he I remember very, let me just real quick on this one. I remember very starkly um, uh, uh, an article at uh, antiwar.com at the time is that well, um, uh, we should remember that, that the United States used its uh, tanker planes to refuel um, uh, uh, Saudi aircraft. Uh, who knows who were flying them? And uh, the Pentagon forgot to bill them for it. I mean, that's how insane this policy was, is that they were refueling in air hundreds of millions of dollars, probably, and somebody forgot to build them. That's how insane and irrational this thing was. I'm sorry, George. Go no, ahead. no, no. But, and of course, it was Obama and Hillary Clinton who engineered the coup. Uh, against Saleh, uh, who had actually been a very loyal American ally during the uh, the war on terror, they are engineered that you know Saleh must go, just like you know Gaddafi must go, Assad must go, uh, Mubarak must go, and of course that triggered the whole uh, civil war. Uh, and then eventually, when you know Saleh joined with the the Houthis, that was that was the moment when uh, Obama gave the green light. Um, but do you then see this uh, con this continuing? I mean, Houthis are going to just continue um, as long as the the war in Gaza continues. I mean, they're, they're not going to relent. Is this is that's that's how you see it? Yes, I think it's going to continue, and they're going to uh, continue to strike ships that are linked to the Israelis, 
as well as ships that are linked to those countries that are a part of this so-called armada or coalition. Uh, I don't see them backing down and I don't see a, a, a winnable situation for the Americans. The, uh, the Yemeni armed forces, all of their capabilities are portable. They, they don't have, first of all, they're well protected underground, as I said. But second of all, these are all portable. They, they don't have like these big radar sites, which you, you know, people see on TV. They come out, they quickly do what it is they want to do. They have long range missile capabilities, so they don't have to be near anywhere near the shore. They have drones, they have everything. They can hit and then go back underground. The Americans can fire all the Tomahawk missiles they want, and they don't have all that many, and they're very expensive, but they're not going to hit targets. They'll keep saying that we're degrading their defenses, but they're not. Uh, the Saudis were doing it for seven years, and uh, they they completely failed and lost the did, war. I, Why? I think, did you see the... Um, uh... Uh, even uh, I think it was Al Jazeera didn't even want to call it a vessel. It was kind of like a glorified boat, um, something that you would see like on the Mekon River in in uh, in Southeast Asia. And they showed their discovery of these um, uh, parts, these uh, weapons, you know. And it was like one simple picture. It, it kind of looked like you know a kid coming home from Halloween and presenting what they got in their you know their paper bag, you know their candy. Okay, it was such a small, modest thing. It was almost kind of embarrassing. And I thought, how much money are they putting into this armada? And they got some trinkets, which of course. I can't tell if they're real or not. I mean, it, again, they, 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 they're they losing it, the information more because people just simply don't understand why are you doing this, okay? And why don't you, why is it such a bad idea to have a ceasefire? We wouldn't have to be going through all of this. Well, if they, let's say they do take these, some weapons from some small, some boat somewhere. That's what Netanyahu do, used to do too. He went, he would go and, look over these weapons that they captured that were go supposed to go to Gaza. And I'm pretty sure that some of these boats are actually intended to be captured. But anyway, okay. so, uh, so Netanyahu goes and says we've captured all these weapons. But when war starts, we see that uh, Hamas uh, and its allies, Islamic Jihad and others, they have factories under underground. They have hospitals underground. They have hundreds of tunnels, hundreds of kilometers of major tunnels going in every direction. They have command centers underground. How was that all created? So obviously, they were incapable of stopping the resistance and the supporters of the resistance, meaning Iran. Yemen is much bigger than Gaza. It's much more accessible. It has a huge coastline. And the Americans are not going to be able to stop them when the Saudis and the Emiratis with American support were, un were unable to stop them in the past. So this is this is just going to create a, 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 an economic problem. I'm not saying a, a global economic crisis. We already have a global economic crisis, which is going to get worse and worse. And we're moving towards, I think, catastrophe ultimately. But this is only going to make it all that much worse especially for the Europeans, especially for the Europeans, so, because yeah. the countries well, they, that are affected they, the most they, they are the Europeans. Have, they seem to have a no limit to sacrifice. It's it's truly amazing. <laughs> yes, because none of the European ships were threatened. And Sarallah, the Yemenis, and they also, by the way, have uh, small submarines. They have you know the capabilities to, 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 to stop shipping. But they simply wanted to stop ships from going to Israeli ports. They wanted to enforce a blockade to stop the genocide. And if the Americans and the British and the Europeans are so concerned about international trade and international law, well, when Iranian fuel ships were going to Syria, why were the Israelis allowed to bomb them? And no one complained about it. When Iranian ships were being hijacked in the high seas by the Americans, who complained about it? When uh, a ship that was moving towards Gaza to give support to the Gazans a decade ago, more than a decade ago, when, it when 10 people on that ship were killed by the Israelis, including uh, 
a young man with dual citizenship, American citizenship. Ten people were killed in international waters. Who complained? Who took it to the UN? Who built an armada? Who created a global or regional naval task force to stop the Israelis? No one. So this has nothing to do with international law. This has everything to do with allowing the Israelis to do what it wants, to do what it has to do, to carry out the genocide. The Americans are all in for the moment. For the time being, they are still against, even though we see Blinken traveling, traveling around the region, the Americans are, are fully supporting the war. They are supporting escalation, and they are part of the escalation. Well, let's, let's talk found... about what, what does that entail? Because uh, George and I have uh, believed from the get-go that um, uh, this is a, for many, it's a um, an opportunity uh, to settle scores all across the region. And of course, that includes uh, Hezbollah, uh, Yemen, and ultimately Iran. Uh, do you think that's part of the, do you think they're that foolish to e even think about it? Well, they, certainly they're thinking about it. How about uh, uh, proceeding with it? Well, they've also bombed Iraq and Syria. The okay. Americans bombed a major military official within the government ministry of interior within their complex. So the Americans are not, it's not just the Israelis that are escalating by carrying out terror attacks in Beirut or in Damascus where they killed an Iranian general, but the Americans bombed Syria, the Americans bombed Iraq, the Americans bombed Yemen, and they've killed people in all three countries. So the United States is a part of the escalation. I don't believe it's going to uh, end in a confrontation between Iran and the United States, because I don't think the Americans are that stupid. You may give a counter argument saying, no, you're wrong. Actually, they are that stupid. I, I, I have no response to that. I just state that I no, think- We can always play the, the Lindsey Graham card. That's, that's too yeah. easy. I, I think that would be a bridge too far. I think the Americans know that that would be the end of the global economy because there's a sort of balance of terror because of all the Iranian uh, Iran's capability to end the oil and gas trade. And because Iran has so many regional allies, it would be just too much for the United States. But I do think that the Americans are prepared for an escalation in, let's say, Lebanon. I think they are escalating in Yemen. They may go further in Iraq, but the problem for the Americans is that it's not winnable. Yemen is not going to back down and they have the capability to do the harm that they want to inflict. And the Americans, all they can do is kill ordinary people and spend a lot of money creating very little material damage. In, and in Iraq, if they escalate, it's only going to create greater momentum in Iraq for the expulsion of the Americans. And if there's an escalation in Lebanon, then I think, well, first of all, Lebanon is far stronger than Hamas. Uh, Hezbollah is far stronger than Hamas. And Hezbollah right now is fighting at a disadvantage because they don't want the fighting to go deep inside Lebanon because they want to keep the Lebanese people on board. They don't want to be seen as the aggressor. So they're fighting on the borderline. So it's very difficult for them to avoid casualties because they are fighting from a very small area. But if the Israelis come into Lebanon, then it will be all out war and, the, and Hezbollah's tunnels, I think uh, will make the Moscow Metro look pretty <laughs> insignificant. So the, about, the Israelis yeah. can't, can't win there. But then if the Americans come in, in Lebanon, then I think the Americans will be kicked out of Iraq. Well, what about um, um, going, just going back to uh, Gaza? Because again, you know, we, which we have to try and figure out what exactly is Netanyahu's end game here. I mean, I think Peter suggested uh, many times that he thinks the end game is to drive out the um the, the palestinians from gaza you know or everybody just, just just drive them out so i mean that's one possibility but if that if that doesn't come about then what is the end game i mean netanyahu said no no we're not going to have the palestinian authority they're not they're not going to be in charge here obviously we can't have hamas then they've been talking about this plan what they used to do in the 1980s in the west bank you know having these mayors and city councillors running things but that was a complete failure 
So what what is the end game here? What 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 is the Netanyahu's goal here? Well, the Americans were much more powerful than the Israelis. They had an end game for Afghanistan. They had an end game for Iraq. They had an end game for Libya. They, they had an end game for Iran and Lebanon. None of them work. And Syria. And Syria. Assad has to go. Well, what happened? All those people are gone now, but Assad still remains. So the Israelis can talk about an end game, but so far they've had no success. Absolutely none whatsoever. All, at the beginning of the war, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, the leader, he said that the resistance in Gaza will win. And I interpreted it, I, 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 my interpre interpretation of that at the time was that they have very solid defense capabilities, even though I had no idea what they were. But I know that he knows what what's going on there. So he said it's, they're going to win. And uh, that meant basically that what exists underground is something new and unique in in the world you know in 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 the contemporary you know military uh battlefield so hamas and back then the iranians were saying early on that this war is going to take months so their calculations the iranian calculations which must be you know, they must, they're in constant contact with Hamas and Islamic Jihad and other resistance groups. They knew this was going to happen from day one. They knew that Hamas and its allies are going to hold, uh, be able to hold their ground. So I think that the longer this takes, every day that this continues, Israel loses, not the resistance. But everyone wants a ceasefire because they're slaughtering women and children. So for the Israelis, they cannot win. All they can do is kill people. Maybe that makes them happy. Maybe that makes them feel better, massacring women and children. But it's destroying the Israeli regime's reputation across the board. This is something that you know better than I. And, and that is that the Israel's, Israel was never favorably viewed in the global, global South. For the enormous hostility towards Israel like we see today. But in the West, pro-Israeli sentiments were always very strong, always very strong. But now we see a sea change. So if the, the, the Israelis are losing on the ground, on the battlefield, but they're also losing public opinion. So when they murder people, they lose. When they fight on the battlefield, they lose. So the more they fight, the worse it gets for them. I don't see how the Israelis can make things any better. And the longer that they go on, the more entrenched these negative views about Israel become. And I think that itself is important because people forget, you know, people move on. You know, I, uh, you know, some, some new event happens and public opinion goes anywhere. But there is this latent knowledge that becomes entrenched in the unconscious and in, in the minds of, you know, the collective. Uh, yeah, it's, it's one of the interesting things, as you're well aware of, the uh, the primary season started yesterday in uh, in Iowa. And I don't want to talk about it because it's not important, but the, the media made it important. They want to shift the, the, the narrative to talk about something. They don't want to talk about Ukraine anymore. They don't want to talk about, oh my goodness, Gaza anymore. Uh, because everybody that's interested in it is watching, using, uh, 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 going to different media outlets and they know it, okay? Um, you know, so they, they're looking for a diversion. But on the point that you just made, I think it's very interesting because this is something I think George and I can attest to, particularly myself growing up uh, um, my entire young uh, life in America, is that, Israel was it was always kind of skin deep because you never heard anything alternative. You know, you heard about the hostage crisis. OK, then there's always the uh, angry Arab in uh, in Hollywood. You know, it's all very superficial, very superficial. But with the advent of yeah, social hypersexualized media, Arab. Yeah, yeah, know, yeah, right. Yeah, oh, yeah. Gangs, well, they, they tried, and all that. They tried the, the, the systemic rape story, which completely fell apart. I mean, George and I were one of the first to forensically just, just annihilate the story. We spent many hours doing it. George, with his wonderful art of 
line by line by line. Um, uh, we, we were one of the first to do it. I'm very proud of our work here. But yeah, I'm agreeing with you. I mean, these narratives were very superficial because you never had anything that countered it. And then you have this um, culture of, of um, 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 so a, a kind of a superlative culture. You know, all Arabs are bad. E even Persians are Arabs, you know, because nobody knows the difference and all of that. But that it's really interesting how that has been shattered. And, and, and something that I've talked about with my guests on my program, even they are surprised how it is so easily shattered. And the, the Israel and the US, the Biden administration, they're just digging a deeper and deeper and deeper hole. Well, you know uh, that my well, understanding is that genocide that's seen live on uh, the internet uh, has a bigger impact apparently than genocide that we read about in history books. And when you see it live on the internet, apparently when American government officials and Europeans and German right. officials are saying no to a ceasefire, it looks even worse, apparently. Uh, who would have thought? Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, that, that's right. But just uh, again, uh, going back to this uh, issue of the sort of how, how does it end? Because well, and what do you do with the Palestinians? That's what George. Well, that's, well, that's right. You got. I mean, how many have been killed? I mean, you know, officially the this the uh, the, the Gaza figures. I think twenty five thousand killed. And you you pointed out in that interview on the BBC that it's likely to be much higher than that. Um, but you know, does this just simply go on, or is is there a point at which you know the, something uh, happens? I mean, you know, just you you, you can't wipe out. I assume you can't just kill two million um, uh, Palestinians. So, you know, how, how do you actually envisage that this uh, comes to an end? Well, I think the Israelis would be more than willing to kill two million I do too. Uh, Palestinians. I, I was uh, invited to do an interview um, uh, on a, a Western media outlet, and they sent this, They there was this Muslim woman who was interviewing me, you know, this to, to, to sort of make strengthen their position. And she was saying, and when I said there's a genocide going on, and, and she said that no, no, that there's no genocide. And look at there were six, you know, six, she said six million Jews were killed, were killed during the Second World War. And I said, well, I'm sorry, there are not enough people in Gaza and there's not enough time to get six million killed. But I don't think we're going to allow that to happen anyway. But uh you know they're they're more than willing to let two million people get killed in Gaza. I have no doubt about it because every day we're seeing genocide, and the West, you know Western leaders just look on and say, you know, this is you know the, the Israelis have to be able to, to October the seventh, you know that sort of thing. But uh, I think that uh, I can't you know predict the future. And uh, once someone said I I can't predict the future because I I, I hate being wrong. But I can't predict the future because so many things are happening. But what I can say is that, uh, and um, this is something you just alluded to, and that was the Ukraine war. The Ukraine war is still going on and we've completely forgotten about it, uh, thanks to the Americans. I mean, we haven't forgotten, forgotten about it, but the Western media has. This is going to get more and more difficult for the West, especially in the months ahead, because the Russians are going to press their advantage. I mean, they're always going to win. I have we knew that from day from the beginning. When during the negotiations, the nuclear negotiations in Vienna, I was speaking to Western journalists and Western intellectuals or people affiliated with the establishment, and I was saying the Russians are going to win. There's no, there's there's just no way for Ukraine to win. But they were all so, very confident that universally that no, no, the Russians will lose. Well, now the Russians are winning, but with what's going, with all the things that are going on now in Gaza, in our region, elections across Europe and, and North America, it's going to be more difficult for the West to manage all these conflicts. And they don't want to call it quits anywhere. They want to win all of their wars. So it's, I, I think they're destined to lose, but I think when, when you have all, you have two major conflicts going on at the same time, you're definitely destined to lose. Well, but one of the, you know, the, the thing that really uh, catches my attention is that um, I guess to say kind of rather 
ineloquently is that I fully expected something like this from the Israelis given 75 years of Zionism. I mean, for many people, this is the greatest opportunity of their entire existence is to completely clear the board. And, you know, why don't we take care of the West Bank, by the way? And, you know, in that northern part of uh, Lebanon, we've always kind of liked it because of the water shelf. And, you know, it, it solves a lot of these problems here. I, I don't I, I, I don't contest that there are plenty of people that think that way and see this as an opportunity. It's the, the consequences that the West will have to absorb for backing this, you know, I agree with you. I don't know what the future is. All I know it's gonna be awful and it's get more and more dangerous for all of us, okay? But the, the, this, the totally ideologically blinded and intellectually facile approach that the West has, the West has lost complete legitimacy. And we have known each other for many, many years and we have talked about this. But I mean, this is, it's so glaring in your face, the mask is off. And I don't see how you go around that because if we have um, um, populations in the West that are realizing is that, well, what do we have to do? Why should we be involved with this? This is, you know, I don't want, I mean, because either way, when I'm looking at it, I feel guilty even watching it. I feel like I'm culpable by witnessing it. What about the decision makers that are pursuing it? Yes, and uh, absolutely. I mean, when I watch, I always feel like, what can I do? You know, just I, all I can do is tweet or do a couple of interviews. Well, but we're doing always, our best, the three of us. I know well, it. Okay. Whether you, you all, it's, so, it's a very, you know, it's really difficult and sometimes to sleep at night because you're constantly thinking about all these images and what's going on. And even though I've always been highly critical of the West, I really never thought they, they it'd be this bad. I, I thought that they would pressure the Israelis to stop or they would even, oh, even while they're supporting them behind the scenes, they put some pressure. I, I never thought they would be so openly genocidal and the Western media so openly genocidal and justifying genocide or being apologetic for genocide. It's, it's extraordinary. But I agree completely. The Israelis were always looking for this opportunity. Anyone who follows Israeli culture and, uh, um, and the media, their uh, Hebrew media, not the English media, the Hebrew media, and anyone who's watched some of the documentaries made by critics uh, of Israel and how racist Israelis are, they, they, they knew that this would, this would happen ultimately when the opportunity came about. Because the Israelis always considered the Palestinians to be subhuman. They consider everyone to be a Zionist, to be subhuman compared to them. So, so why wouldn't they be, behave like that? Especially when in the West, they allow them to think that way. They encourage them, they help them, they support them. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a abusive person uh, who's always being allowed to carry out his abuse. He, he thinks that's normal. So, and, and But ultimately, as you rightly pointed out, it's the West that's going to pay the price. And they have paid the price. And this is, I think, the most important point of all. And that is that Israel has, at least for the last few decades, its existence has always been detrimental to Western interests. Maybe during the Cold War it was different, but over the last few decades it's definitely been detrimental. But the West is sacrificing itself for Israel, and Israel is more than happy to see the West sacrifice itself for Israel. It's a very interesting that you you point this out because you know at the gaggle you know we've referenced many times in the past where people in the West realize well you know Israel is detrimental to our interests, particularly in Europe. I mean, I remember the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982. There was a sharp difference between uh, the, the attitude of the Reagan administration, which where the Secretary of State Hay kind of colluded with Israel, and the leaders in, in Europe, like Helmut Schmidt, who were very strongly opposed, and they did think this is detrimental to us. You know, it's in our interest to have good relations um, with the Arab states uh, in the Middle East. And, uh, and, and, and again, even when Richard Nixon, I mean, he was, you know, be before he died, he said, you know, I as a president knew it was important for United States interests to have good relations with Arab states. You know, we have a sentimental attachment to Israel, but, you know, it's also our interest. But that is gone. And it's now we have this this completely 
you know, monochromatic view coming from the Americans and the Europeans. You know, where are the Europeans? Where where is the European voice? Well, in you know, this? you know, George, and add to it. You know, I, I don't want to. I try to avoid a hyperbole, but you know, Germany's position. I mean, the the country that that um, uh, uh, perpetrated the a genocide in the 20th century is backing another country in the 21st century to do exactly the same thing. I mean, it, I mean, historically, it is it leaves you um, speechless. I mean, they learned the the Germans learned the wrong lesson about the Holocaust. Really? No, it's because it's neoliberal ideology that that's what's doing it. This ideology that comes out of the West paralyzes you morally. And the crimes committed during the Second World War by Germany are not the first, as recently uh, African leaders and uh, politicians and intellectuals are quick to point out. The Germans have carried out atrocities and genocide in many parts of Africa during the early parts of the 20th century. So they really have an extraordinarily dark past, but it is amazing that the Europeans have shifted in this direction. They were more reasonable during, let's say, uh, the, the Reagan years. But now the, you know, we saw what happened in Ukraine. The Germans were willing to sacrifice their people. You know, it doesn't matter what our popular the German foreign minister said, uh, that you know, we don't care what public opinion says. We're we're right behind Ukraine. So obviously they don't care what happens to the Gazans. They're right behind their ally in Tel Aviv. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's right. And, and it goes to the, again, the interesting case with uh, Germany is that, first of all, Germany is more responsible than anyone else for the creation of the state of Israel and then for continually funding Israel. So, and for the Palestinians, you know, the Germans have been really the, 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 their worst nightmare. I mean, they, you know, are, <laughs> next to Israel, Germany has inflicted the most. Uh, suffering on the uh, Palestinians, and so it's entirely typical that now they said we are going to step in uh, in the in this case at the ICJ on behalf of Israel. Well, that's what we yeah. would have expected. Yeah, but George, they, they they have no sense of irony, do they? We have these genocide uh, conventions because of what the because Germans of, did of, during the Second World War. They they, I, you know, I've always had a problem with the German sense of humor, but I never thought that they had a problem with irony. But apparently, they do. Apparently they do. Apparently they do. And I and I think the only thing that is going to end this is when it becomes a burden that they can no longer carry. And I, I think that, you know, Ukraine and I can't say just now Gaza anymore. It's no longer Gaza. It's more than Gaza. Uh, the, these two combined with the economic crisis, the elections that are uh, coming, they're the West is not, they don't have a winning hand. They couldn't win in Afghanistan. How are, going, how are they going to win this, this battle when they've lost the hearts and minds of the international community, when their economy is declining, and when the Israeli regime is so openly genocidal? It's, you know, in the past, like, I don't, you know, I'm not a great historian, but it, Saddam Hussein, at least, I, I, I don't want to go back to Hitler, but Saddam Hussein or any or previous Israeli genocidal leaders or whoever never actually went and said, no, we want to kill people. We're out there to massacre them. You know, or maybe I don't know. I've seen some of Hitler's speeches and, and uh, you know, I don't know how, how often they say, no, we want to kill all of them. We're, you know, we're murdering them. Usually in the past, people never would said hide. They never said it. He, he, no, they, 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 I think, George, uh, the historical record reflects that the, the war uh, against the Soviet Union will be a war of annihilation. Well, th that's a pretty big statement, but it's not saying we're going to kill every single one of them. Yes, that's exactly. They, in the past, they wouldn't open and say, yes, we're going to kill all these people. Uh, I don't know what it was like in Germany, but apparently when uh, the, the, the Nazi regime would collapse, they would take like people to, to the, these death camps and show them what was going on there. And a lot of them weren't even in Germany. They were in Poland. So but I'm not sure about these things. So, but, so I won't put, I don't want to press it too much. But at least I can say that about Saddam Hussein, who killed uh, hundreds of thousands of Iraqis and at least, a, you know, a couple of hundred thousand Iranians. 
He never said, oh, we want to kill people. We want to massacre people. These are subhuman. He pretend that he's like after human rights. He pretend that he's a nice guy. He pretend that he cares about people. And but he but, you know, the Israelis, they go. And when you looked at the South African complaint, the Israelis were giving them all the uh, the ammunition that they needed. They didn't have enough time to go and put out all that uh, government officials were saying, and the military were repeating on the battlefield. Was, or Out of the 84-page brief, 15 pages, almost single lines of 15 pages, were comments by high officials in Israel, in politics, media, and in the military. Think about that. 15 pages out of 84. And that wasn't exhaustive. That only went up to somewhere in the early uh, weeks of December. OK, I, I want to because we're rapidly running out of time. Um, we're for, a, a lot of even those of us that are very concerned about these issues here. Not enough attention is given to the West Bank. And it's horrific what's going on there. It's I mean, hundreds have been killed. Exactly. I mean, and, and because the slaughter the, the death camp known as Gaza gets our attention first for obvious reasons. But what's going on in the West Bank is it, it's another it's a, a lower intensity genocide, but it is nonetheless a genocide. Without a doubt, it's really bad. And apparently it's getting worse because a lot of the troops that are being pulled out of Gaza because they they were defeated. They're now going to the West Bank to intensify the conflict since October the 7th. Hundreds of people have. Let's see, it's, let's see if he can, uh, comes back here. Um, we apologize for that. Mohammed probably yeah. got a telephone call. Oh, and yes, exactly. Yeah. But I think he's going to. Yeah, yeah, I told you he'd come back. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so. Um, what was I saying? <laughs> oh, we're talking about the, the what was you know we shouldn't overlook yeah, what's going the West, on the West Bank. Bank yeah. So hundreds of people have been killed, and these are not Hamas. This is not Gaza. This is it's not the two pieces of territory aren't even connected. But you don't see anything in the Western media. You don't you don't see any Western European, North American, Canadian, Australian, or the ambassador for New Zealand. We don't see any of them making statements about the killings that are going well, on well, in the they're, West Bank. They're there. They're sitting in nice hotels in Tel Aviv. Okay. Exactly. I mean, it's not because they don't have a presence, everyone. They do. International media has a presence. They just won't report it. They will not report it. And if you check like the Twitter accounts or the X accounts or whatever it's called uh, of uh, EU officials and American officials in, there's nothing about Gaza. No, I'm sorry, nothing about okay. the West Bank, nothing about the West Bank. So, and I have no doubt that if the Israeli regime succeeds in the West Bank, they're going to do the same thing in, in sorry, if they succeed in Gaza, they're going to do the same thing in the West Bank. And that's why it's so important that the, they must be exposed. And of course, as we've been discussing earlier, they've exposed themselves, but even though they are openly genocidal, Western media saying, no, 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 this is not a genocide. No, no, you know, uh, the Western government officials, no, no, of course it's not a genocide. They're saying it's a genocide. They're saying, we, you know, we we, you know, we have genocidal intent. And they're, you know, the Western media and Western, no, no, that's, that's not happening. And I have no doubt if, if they do get the opportunity to do the same thing in the West Bank, the same narrative in the West will continue. George, I promise you, they will, if they can kill 2 million people, they'll do it. And if they can kill 3 more million people in the West Bank, they will do it. And the Western media will not turn against Israel. The only thing that will stop Israel is if the situation gets so bad for the West that they have to make new calculations. Mm -hmm. Like in, in what way, like how bad do you, do you mean? Like a global economic crisis? What, what, what do you mean? Yeah, something, some, whether it's the, a global economic crisis or whether people turn against the government because of the declining economy and the upcoming elections, maybe they'll become more authoritarian. Maybe people will start revolting here or there. Maybe parties that are against these policies will start gaining more power. I don't know. But I do know that this, this year, the next 12 months, 
will probably be an extraordinary period in human history. And I think huge change is going to take place. I don't know, you know, how I, I as uh, as you both, you know, rightly say, it's probably going to get a whole lot worse for the world. But I don't, I think that probably the pressure on the West is more burdensome than other parts of the world. Uh, talk and about that, burden here. One of the things that I think that it's unreported, and we have to be really honest here, is Arab governments have been shameful in their uh, position towards the Palestinians for decades. It's really shameful. But those are governments, and most of them are not democracies. Most of them are just royal families or just autocrats, uh, which align very, with, without any kind of um, um, barrier, align with the whole Biden administration's democracy versus autocracy. We won't waste our time talking about how contradictory and stupid that is. But, you know, there, there's a phrase that's used, I don't use it very often because I, I'm not from the, um, the Arab street, so I don't like using it because I don't know what it means, but let's, you, you know, because you, you know, it's implied what it means here. They're watching all of this too, and their governments are benign. What kind of impact is that having and what, and what kind of result could you see? Yes, we don't know. Well, I mean, remember what happened during the so-called Arab Spring or, or the awakening, or I, I call it the we, I call it the Arab winter. Okay, you know we we don't know. One day everything is calm. Suddenly things begin to fall apart. No one knows. But when there's so much anger towards the West, both in Europe, in North America, so many contradictions in the West. When there's so much anger in the Arab world, where where now the great heroes in the Arab world is Ansarullah, is the Yemeni government. Just a couple of years ago, even though the Saudis were carrying out genocide, there was very little sympathy because the whole media was against them. Even the Arab media was supporting the Saudis. Uh, they're just now, terrorists. They're just terrorists. Yes. Remember? Yeah. So genocide was carried out against them. The world was quiet. Now they're standing up for Gaza and people have been put to shame and they're, they become heroes. The, these circumstances, I don't know what will happen. A lot of things are, there's a lot going, uh, it's sort of like under the sea. The sea looks calm, but under the sea, many things are happening. I don't know where it's going to go, but I'm pretty sure that it's not to, it's not going to end well for the West. Could I just ask, um, as we're you know, almost at the end, that ter horrible, terrible uh, terrorist incident in uh, Iran, what, what do we know about that? I mean, uh, where, where, where is the investigation on that? Well, I don't know the details, but we do know that Jaish al Islam, which is in Pakistan, in that sort of no man's land where the Pakistani government sadly doesn't have much control, that they used to be funded by Western intelligence agencies and the Saudis. Now, apparently, the Saudis have stopped funding these different groups. That's my understanding. But the West and the Israelis, they still are working with them. ISIS has, and you know that ISIS and Al-Qaeda have a long relationship with the West. And ISIS was also, they had bases alongside the Golan. And when the Syrians would attack uh, their positions, the, the Israelis would bomb Syrians, they would use artillery to defend ISIS and Al-Qaeda because they were based they were alongside one another. And they would treat their injured. So the Israelis have a strong relationship with ISIS the and these all these different terror groups like the Americans. And they're good, not only they're not only good to put pressure on Iran during this period, but also they're good to threaten the Belt and Road Initiative, the different corridors in Asia, that these are good tools that the West have and use. So the Iranians began to strike back at these targets because some of these operations are carried out in cooperation, uh, or some of them by the Israelis, some of them by these terrorists, and some of them perhaps they're doing working on them together. I don't know the details, but I think that the escalation in terror attacks is definitely linked what, to what is going on in Gaza. Peter, you want to ask any, any another? No, I, 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 I was just going to say that this, uh, because of the West support, uh, um, uh, uh, complete support of Israel. A lot of uh, a lot of actors in the region are going to look for, look to their advantage and um, and play out um, different gambits. Again, this is all the law of unintended consequences. I think your your analogy, you know, the sea on the top looks relatively placid, but below it's very very turbulent. 
And I think it's good to boil up. I think all three of us agree with that. And our viewers do too. 2024 is going to be a year to remember for, <laughs> for probably the very worst reasons. <laughs> right. Quite possibly. Thank Thank yes, probably. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Morandi. As always, an absolutely fascinating uh, conversation. A lot of food for thought. And I think gagglers are going to be uh, very, very happy with this. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Peter. And remember, if you like the gaggle, please like, share, and subscribe. See you soon. Bye.